Hey everybody, Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with our lecture series. We have sponsors for our lectures. This week's sponsor is Stephen Hensley. Thank you, Stephen, for sponsoring the lecture. And if you want to sponsor a lecture, contact Karen, karen at atlchessclub.com. And we'll be happy to negotiate with you as long as you meet our price. Uh, this week's lecture, the sponsor wanted me to talk about the Benko Gambit, but he was actually very specific. Now, first of all, if you're in Eastern Europe, you're like, what's the Benko Gambit? Okay, that's the Volga Gambit. But in America, we call it the Benko Gambit. So if you see Benko or Volga Gambit, it's the same thing. Although originally, you know, back in the day, there was a very slight difference in the Benko and Volga Gambit, but now they're just used interchangeably. Um, you can see the article in Wikipedia. It talks about the opening. It talks about the various different moves White can play, how it started. Um, Benko wrote a book on it in 1974, I believe. And that's why people started calling it the Benko Gambit. He did a lot of opening analysis on it. Um, so in the Benko Gambit, it's a gambit. So you can accept the gambit or you can decline. Today we're going to look at accepting the gambit because that's what the sponsor wants. Now, the sponsor has some interesting ideas, which may or may not be true. Mainly they're true. So the, the sponsor knows what's up. I mean, if he's given the money, it has to be true. But he's, he's mostly correct. Um, he said, how come nobody plays the Benko Gambit at the top level anymore? I don't see any games in these tournaments in Benko Gambits. And he's right. I agree. And he said, so just show the refutation. Let's, let's, get, let's get past all this. Show me why super GMs don't play the Benko with black. Now, I'm not a super GM, so I can't give a definitive answer, but I can give a pretty good answer. And if you buy my chessable course, I actually have a line against the Benko Gambit, which is not the line we're going to look at, which I think is easier for white to play. This is a little more um, super GM complex and strategical. So uh, the Benko Gambit is still played at all different levels, but... Um, one of the main practitioners, uh, Victor Bulligan, he, he was, you know, 27, 20, 27, 30 feet A, and now he's not. So if he's still playing the Benko Gambit, I really don't know because he's, he's not in the top tournaments anymore. So when he was in the top tournaments, he'll play the Benko Gambit 10, 15, 20 years ago. But now that he's older and not in the top 30 in the world, I, I don't know if he still plays it or not. Um, okay, but we'll look at a couple of his games and some other games. There's a very long Wikipedia article about the gambit. It even has some theory, has some explanation about why black plays g6 before bishop takes a6, which I'll talk about in the lecture, um, which I was told by Patrick Wolf. So Patrick Wolf uh, was a friend of mine and still is. He texted me a month ago, so I guess he's still a friend of mine. Uh, we just don't talk very much. Like most of my friends. Uh, wait, are they friends? Um, and we used to hang out, and we went to a tournament in England together in 86, and he was showing me some Benko Gambit theory because he played it, and I decided I would play it then, so I played it for a couple years. But I sort of stopped playing it. Um, I didn't want to learn all the theory and all the new theory and all the different ways white could play. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a baby. Okay, let's, let's get to the chessboard. And we'll do a new share. Man, I'll have to do a new share. It used to be I had to do a new share, and now the board just, I don't understand it. You can see the board, right? Thumbs, yeah. Okay, I don't know. I used to have to do stuff for that, but now it automatically does it. So I, I, don't, I don't know. Okay. So the first game we're going to look at, we're going to look at the games in chronological order. Uh, the first game is Karpov Gelfand from, from the 90s when Karpov was really, really, really good. And Gelfand was really, really, really good. So that's a long time ago, of course. Not for me. 1995, that was, that was my sweet spot. Okay, so the Benko Gambit and the Volga Gambit, for those of you who don't know, come on, chessboard. Okay, is C5, D5, B5. Now, in this position, white can take on B5 or white cannot take on B5. The sponsor of the stream, Mr. Hensley, said, I, I want to take on b5 and take on a6. I don't want to look at nothing else. 
So I have a, a few games we're going to look at with, with those lines. And I wanted to point out White also plays knight f3 quite often. And the line that I recommend in my chessable course is queen c2, which I've played several times, but, you know, 15, 20, 25 years ago, I don't face the Benko Gambit very much nowadays. Maybe that sponsor knows what he's talking about. Because when I play chess on chess.com, I play a lot of blitz and bullet. I don't have this position a lot. I have it, but it's, it's pretty rare. And I, I will allow it. This is how I play with white. Okay, so white takes, and black plays a6. And if, you were, if we were doing a lecture 50, 60, 70 years ago, your internet would be terrible. It would just be terrible internet. I don't even know if you could understand me. But in those days, this was the Benko Gambit. And if you played another move, it was the Volga Gambit. And typically that move was e6. N nobody plays e6 anymore. So it's, it's, not, it's not played. Um, it was played in the 50s and 60s, I guess. Then they're like, that's no good. And um, in this position, nowadays we call this the Benko Gambit or the Volga Gambit if you live in those parts of the world. And white doesn't have to take to be a Benko Gambit. You can decline. So takes a6. In this position, white has three moves that grandmasters play often. You can take on a6, which is the theme of our lecture. You can play b6, which is also quite common, or you can play e3. In the 1980s and early 90s, everybody played e3. The Benko Gambit was very popular in America in the 80s and 90s. A lot of the top players in the country would play it with black, and they had antidotes with white that were not like the mainstream theory. So even in the U.S. Championship, you saw some Benko Gambit games, you know, 30 years ago. Um, one of the popular contributors of theory in the Benko Gambit was Lev Albert, and he was U.S. champion several times, and he even won back-to-back -back years. I think he, I think he might have three-peated. So Lev Albert is still alive, but hasn't played chess in maybe 20 years, maybe, maybe more. Um, but he was one of the top 10 players in the U.S. in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, I would say. Although maybe not early 2000s, that might be a little late for him. Okay, so we take on a6. Now, what's funny is the only person who ever talked to me about the Benko Gambit that was at my level or better, in this case, better, Grandmaster Patrick Wolf, uh, he played the Benko Gambit and he said, I don't like to play Bishop takes a6 here because white can play b3. And then after g6, he plays Bishop b2, and then he fianchettos his other bishop. And Benko players don't like to play black here because the bishop, I, I fianchetto my bishop, which takes this thing out of your bishop. And he said, therefore, Benko players who know what they're doing, they play the move g6, which is what Gelfand did. And here's the difference. And Patrick Wolf told me this in 1986, and I, I never heard anybody talk about it or seen a move order difference, but now if white plays b3, bishop g7, bishop b2, now black doesn't play bishop takes a6 because white's going to play g3, bishop g2 anyway. What Black plays knight takes a6, and later on he's going to put pressure on these pawns. He's going to play knight b4, which not only puts pressure on the d-pawn, it also attacks the a-pawn on a2. And this is a better way for black to play, to play knight takes a6, in case white does this. And very few players, even after bishop takes a6, will play b3, because you have to learn something extra. If your opponent plays g6 and you don't want to play b3, then learning the b3 line after bishop takes a6 isn't going to happen very often. So typically they transpose, but g6 is more accurate. Super grandmasters know stuff like that. People like me don't care very much, but, I mean, he told me he played the Benko Gambit. That was the opening I knew the best after he talked about it to me for an hour. That's how good I was in the openings when I was 16. Okay, now we're going to look at two different ways for white to play that Super GM seem to like a lot, and they both involve playing G3 for white uh, early in the game. Uh, in one of the games, we're fianchettoing our bishop, in the other three games, we're fianchettoing our king. Although, technically, if you speak Italian, I'm, I'm just kidding. It's a joke. Okay, so 
Knight c3 in both cases. Now bishop takes a6, e4, bishop takes f1, king takes f1. So white wants to play e4 in one move. White doesn't want to move his king around, but he's going to fianchetto his king. It's going to be, all, it's going to be fine. Okay, d6, g3, bishop g7, king g2. So unlike the e3 lines, which we're not looking at, White plays e3 on move 5 or so, then on move 10 or 11 he tries to play e4. So we're not doing that, we're just playing e4 in one move, and White's up a pawn. Now, there's two reasons why grandmasters play an opening and then they stop. So if you said in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, I saw a lot of Benko gambits, and in the last 10 years I don't see any Benko gambits. Okay, so... Typically, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you were playing chess, and when you had black, especially if you were trying to get, if you were playing in an open tournament where there's players of all levels, you had to win with black. Typically now, the top players in the world play in round robins with each other. It's very unusual to see Dingler in, Magnus Carlsen, um... Fabiano Caruana playing a slow game against somebody 2150. Okay? And if they did that, they can't play these lines that draw by force because they can't draw 2150. You know? So you got to play something that's interesting, like the Benko Gambit. So American grandmasters who were playing in Swisses 90% of the time, they had to win with black. They had to beat players rated under 2500. If your U.S. chess rating is 2,600, 2,700, nowadays 2,800, you, you can't draw with 2,300s. Right? You can't do that. And when you have black, you don't have a lot of openings you play for a win when you're playing people your level or higher. So we see a lot of draws at the top level with black equalizing. Nowadays, we have what are called engines and AI. So, um, and obviously when I say AI, I mean Alan Iverson. Oh, you took some water there. I, I, should, I should have watched it. I'll be careful for that before I make a joke. And uh, engines don't like the Benko Gambit so much because white's up a pawn. So if, if you're a grandmaster now or a super grandmaster or you're a preteen and you're 2300, 2400, like a lot of 11 to 15 year olds are now, and you're going to become a super grandmaster, and you're using engines to help you play the opening, and you're using databases, you're, you're not looking at the Benko Gambit. The Benko Gambit's not played by super GMs because the engine says it's good for white. And if you're looking at games played in the last five or ten years, which is what kids are doing, um, well, they might be looking at games in the last year or two. There's no, you can't say like, oh, yeah, that Benko Gambit played by Ding last... No, that, no. Okay, you, you can't point that out. If you were an American player in the 70s or 80s without, without databases, without computers, you were like, hey, this grandmaster plays the Benko Gambit, that grandmaster plays the Benko Gambit, and when I go to my chess club and I play the Benko Gambit, my opponent's confused. So you're playing more for tricks and for complicated play, and you're not looking at the evaluation on the engine because there are no engines. So that's why a lot of these openings where you're sacrificing material were popular 40, 50, 100, 150 years ago, and they're not popular now because the engine says, no, you, you can't do that. And then if your opponent does opening prep and uses an engine and a coach, and you play an opening the engine says is bad, you'll, you'll get bad positions. So that's, that's the main reason the Benko Gambit isn't very popular. But I don't think it's unsound. I think just I'd rather have white. I like being a pawn up. So, okay, so this is the game Karpov Gelfand. We're gonna like skim through the middle game because Karpov moved around in circles and put me to sleep. But you know, White just develops his pieces and says, I'm a pawn up. Plays h3, so black doesn't play knight g4 to e5. And this position looks like a normal chess position. Looks like everybody's playing fine, pieces are where they belong. And the difference is, White's up a pawn. And if you are a super GM, that means that once you were not a super GM. So what happened to you where you were not a super GM 
and you gained three, four, five, six, seven hundred rating points and became one. What happened was you weren't playing unsound gambits. That's what happened. You were playing solid, computer recommended, coach recommended openings. And so if coaches and computers don't like the Benko Gambit, you're not going to like it either. Now, of course, it's good as a surprise weapon because I can't spend all day preparing for the Benko Gambit and nobody, nobody's playing it. I got to spend all day looking at stuff I face a lot. The King's Indian, the Grunfeld, the Nimzo Indian, Queen's Gambit declined, Queen's Gambit accepted. That's what I'm facing. So when I face the Benko Gambit, I'm like, oh yeah, the Benko Gambit, I forgot about that. So if you play the Benko Gambit at home with black, it doesn't really matter what the engine says because you're not 2750 FIDE. And if you are, why are you watching this video? Okay, it's a pretty good video. Okay, so Rook A6, we're going to put all three of our major pieces on the, on the A file. Patrick Wolf told me Rook A7 was an interesting idea. That way when the Black Knight moves, E7 is protected in case of Bishop G5. And if we want to move our knights around, when we move our queen and our rook to the queen's side, where these open files are, we need protection of, of this. Um, but rook a6 is another move. That's the move that Gelfand chose. Bishop g5. Kick the bishop. Karpov's like, hey, you made a weakness. I know what a weakness is. And then queen a8. And I was taught this idea in 86 to move your rook to a7 or a6 and play queen a8. Play rook b8 and pressure on the queen side. Karpov plays very solid, rook e1, b3, knight e8, which is a typical maneuver. The knight sometimes comes to c7, b5, and our bishop is open on the diagonal. So rook e2. Now, if you take the knight and I take back, you don't have to ask me why I played rook e2. Otherwise, you would have asked me, because the rook is defending the a-pawn now, so we're safe. Okay, now in this position, Karpov and Gelfand moved around and around and around and put most spectators to sleep. That's how Karpov did it. He puts you to sleep, then he beats you. So Karpov didn't do very much, moved around and around and around, and Gelfand did the same. And for like 15 moves, nothing happened. And the reason people don't want to have black in the Benko, if they don't, is you're down a pawn. What compensation do you have for a pawn? You got some open files. Are you going to win your pawn back? No. Not, not in this variation. I'm just a pawn up. Okay, so they move around and around. It looks like Karpov can't find anything to do. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. This is how Karpov used to do it. And you're like, well, I guess it'll be a draw because Karpov isn't doing anything. Then eventually Karpov does something and plays the move knight d2. This is a very important move. Okay, the knight wants to go to c4 where the rook is. And white wants to attack on the king's side because black's pieces are all on the queen's side. So white's going to play f4, g4, rar, and make rar noises. And the move knight d2... Uh, lets you play f4. Another idea, which is hard to see now, but I'm going to tell you, so then you'll see it, is the knight protects b3, and you're like, uh, excuse me, the b3 pawn's protected by the a2 pawn. What are you talking about? Well, what happens is, if black ever plays knight b6, which he does, and we trade knights, now white can play a4, and the b3 pawn is protected. And all that stuff happens. So. Okay, so knight b6 happened, takes, takes. Now the a-pawn is attacked twice and defended zero times, so he plays a4. Okay, now, as I've said, the last 20 moves, white's up a pawn. Super grandmasters typically don't sacrifice pawns with black in the opening. That'll explain, like, oh, I have a question. How come nobody good plays the Budapest gambit? It's not because these gambits are bad. The Budapest might be bad. It's not that they're bad, it's that you have to want to sacrifice a pawn with black in the opening. Lower rated players, maybe they like sacrificing, maybe they like crazy gambits, that's their style. Higher rated players typically don't. That's not their style. They're not sacrificing 
a pawn on move two, three, four, five with black, and the engine says they're worse. That's, that's, that's not how super GMs roll. It's a matter of style, it's a matter of taste, and it's a good surprise opening. If you remember correctly, and you have no idea what I'm talking about, Nigel Short played a match with Anatoly Karpov, I'm gonna say 1993, but I'm, I'm within three years, I'm close. Nigel Short won that match, and in one of the games, at least, he played the Budapest Gambit with black, and he drew. Obviously, Karpov's not doing hours of preparation on the Budapest, because nobody plays that. And Nigel said Budapest is okay, so he ended up drawing the game, okay, which was a success with black against Karpov. As you can see, Karpov, being Karpov, has everything under control. He's a pawn up, he has a passed A pawn. White doesn't have an immediate win, but it's hard to say, here's black's compensation. I, I mean, you know, he's a pawn down. Okay, so bishop h6, he wants to take the knight because the knight's protecting b3. Karpov plays f4. Gelfand tries to mix it up with h4, but Gelfand's pieces are on the queen side. So that, that didn't work out. Queen g4, and after takes, he played h4. Karpov said, I'm the one playing on the king's side, not you. My queen is there. Here comes h5. Here comes f5. Here comes knight f3. Here comes rook h1. Here comes rook c3 to g3. Your, your rooks and queen aren't playing on the king's side. So opening the king's side is advantageous to me. Okay, king h7, getting out of the pin. h5. Here comes the queen to defend. Rook c3 to play rook takes g3. f5, Gelfand tries to mix it up. Instead, Gelfand gets mixed up. Karpov doesn't want to trade queens because he's going to play rook takes g3, going to play rook h1, and black better watch out. His king's not too good. Queen f6, he's like, come on, let's trade queens. And Karpov says, we'll trade queens, but only the way I want to do it. Rook h1. Now if we trade queens, your bishop is pinned, you're down a pawn, your f pawn's hanging, your g3 pawn's hanging, and eventually I could just take and play rook h3 and win. And actually, I think that's what Gelfan should have done based on what happened in the game. But that's completely losing. So he played the move f takes e4, rook takes g3. Once again, if you trade queens, white's threatening rook h3. And it's easy to stop that. You could resign. That would stop it. Pretty good way to stop it. Okay, so he played rook b4, defending his pawn, stopping knight takes e4. And there's a brilliant move played by Karpov. Queen g4, threatening queen g8 mate with advantage. Black played rook, rook a8. And this move's great because it looks like a blunder, but it's not a blunder. It just wins the game. He played double up on the bubble up. Okay, and you're like, well, wait, wait a minute. Rook g8 wins the queen. What are you doing? Nah, because the king's overworked. We check, we check again, and then we take the rook on g8. Not defended anymore. And that's the only variation. The other variations are I play rook takes h6 check. Although I guess if it was white's move, I guess queen g5 is better. Well, better is a strong term. Queen g5 also wins. But okay, rook takes h6 is completely winning. Galfand resigned. So that game, Karpov was a pawn up the first 35, 40 moves. He gave the pawn back. Then he had a winning attack against Galfand. Galfand's rooks and queen on the queen side, eh, they, they didn't do very much. So that just seemed like white was a pawn up. Black had negligible compensation and white won. So that, that's not a good game for the Benko Gambit because Galfan's pretty good. He didn't really get any counterplay. Okay, next game is Nakamura Bulligan. This was played about 10 years ago. And uh, Bulligan in the last 15 years, I would say is the highest rated player who's playing the Benko Gambit a lot. And you're probably saying, who's Bulligan? Well, truth hurts. He's from Moldova, I think. And also, I've seen his name, I've seen two different first names for him. Okay, depends on what book you're looking at or what, if he day. I've seen Victor Bulligan 
And I've also seen VRL Bowl again. It's the same person. So I don't, I don't know if he changed his name or one's in Moldova. I don't know. But Bulligan. Bulligan was over 2,700 feet A. And he played the Benko all the time. He's playing the Benko against Naka. Naka takes on A6, G6. Okay. And Naka plays the same way Karpov does. This is still the karpov Gelfan game by transposition. They got this position. Okay. And Karpov, A4. Queen B6. Okay, and this is um, this is actually the most common move here. <clears throat> so Black didn't play Rook A6, Queen A8, Rook B8. He played different than Gelfand, Queen B6. Now if the bishop moves away, I might take this pawn on B2. On the other hand, I might get my queen trapped, but you know, what are you going to do? Queen E2 defending the E pawn and the B pawn. And also if I play knight b5, that's more protected. And it lets my rook go to either e1 or d1. So queen e2 is good. Rook b8, bishop d2. He says, hey, if you want to take my pawn, there it is. There's my pawn. Now, of course, if you take that pawn, your queen's going to get in a lot of trouble. Um, so I, I didn't do any computer analysis, but I'll do some Ben Feingold analysis and see how good that is. I'm guessing not very good. Uh, I was going to play rook b1. I only see one square for the queen here. I don't see anything else. And then knight e1. That was Ben Feing That's Ben Feingold's engine. Me. And then I resign. So, okay. So he didn't take on b2. Played knight e8. Bishop is really strong now. The knight's coming to c7, a6, b4, etc. Rook b1. Naka put both of his rooks on the A and B line, just like his opponent. And again, white did nothing special. White played king g2, queen e2, bishop d2, rook b1. He's staying on the second rank, the first rank. He's not like sacking all of his pieces. And he's a pawn up. And a lot of super grandmasters don't want to be a pawn down without, you know, having like a mating attack or some past pawns or active pieces of the center. Black's pieces are all in the first and second rank also. So we're maneuvering around, trying to outplay our opponent, and white's up a pawn, and it's a passed pawn. And that's why top players, unlike weaker players, they see advantages and disadvantages of what they're doing. And super GMs like to be up a pawn. They don't like to be down a pawn. And lower rated players are like, I got this, I got this. Okay, now I'm a higher rated player. I'm not as high as these guys. I like sacking the exchange, but I don't like sacking a pawn because then I'm down a pawn. If I sack the exchange, I'm down nothing. I have a piece and they have a piece. Who says their piece is better than mine? The engine does? Well, okay. Okay, so the game continued with white just being a pawn up. White played knight d1. There's two reasons for that. Knight e3 to c4 and bishop c3 uh, trading off Black's great bishop. Queen a6 to trade queens. And this is the first move out of theory. In this position, White's played several moves in Grandmaster level. Knight d1's one of them. Rook a3 is one of them. And there's a couple other moves. After knight d1, nobody's ever played queen a6. This is the first, first game that this has happened, and the only game. Nakamura traded queens. Played a5. He's like, I'm a pawn up. I'm going to push it. F5, counterplay in the center. With the e-pawn gone, we can play knight takes d5. Now, Bulligan is probably the highest rated world's leading authority on the Benko Gambit, and the engine just says white's better. 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. It doesn't think black has enough compensation for a pawn. Takes on f5, takes on d5. Black is still down a pawn. And they just played on with black being down a pawn in an endgame. And the game was very complicated. It was sharp. Okay, now uh, you could take on a5, and I think I take on b4. Like, if you play this, I take, and then if you take, I take back. I'm still up a pawn. It's a passed pawn. And if you take this and take this, I'm up a pawn, and it's a passed pawn. And these pawns are actually sort of weak. And the king is weak. Knight g5 could come. Rook here check. The other knight's coming in, 
So uh, black's king and pawn structure isn't very good. So he played the move e6. He's going to play d5. Nakamura traded on b4, traded on b4 again, and rook c1. And this is a position when I prepared for the lecture, I was like, well, maybe I should take this. And the engine says white has a big advantage with rook check. Um, it plays king h7. Although, I mean, I would play king f7 if I, had, if I had the black pieces. Oh, I'm sorry. He didn't, I'm sorry, not rook c8 check. Rook c7. That's what I meant. Rook c7, knight c5, and then knight c4, I think. I think this is right. And white's playing knight g5, knight takes d6. The engine likes white in this position, but I, I would have played rook takes a5. Because, you know, I don't care if the engine likes white. I want to get my pawn back. I give a pawn away, I move three. It's about time I got it back. But he played knight c5, which the engine says is better. It looks like you're going to lose one of the pawns anyway. Both of these pawns are attacked. So knight c5 looks better. Rook c4 attacking the b pawn. Bishop c3 defending the b pawn. Now white has two pawns hanging. Knight d1. Knight takes, 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 takes. White's still a pawn up. And he plays rook a3 and keeps his extra pawn. Okay, now white's going to play... If you play knight b7, for example... I can play knight d4, attacking this pawn, and then I can protect my pawn with knight b3, so I'll still be up a passed pawn. So he played e5 and said, no, you're, you're, not, gonna, you're not gonna play knight d4. If your knight moves away, I'm gonna get my center going. And that's what happened. His knight wants to go to c4, so d5. Now he attacks the pawn. Knight d7, protecting the pawn. Knight e1. They're maneuvering their knights. Rook b3 attacks the knight. This forks the rook at knight, and whites up a pass pawn on the sixth rank. So far, a lot of complications, which obviously Hikaru is good at, and Bulligan is too, but Hikaru is known for weaving his way through complications. And during all those complications, starting on move four, white's a pawn ahead. Black never got his pawn back. Okay, and this is something I remember teaching little kids when I teach them how to play in the opening. I tell little kids, pawns in the center are better than pawns on the side. So like if you're playing e4 and d4 on move one and two, and your opponent's playing h6 and a6, you know, I know who the better player is. I said, but in the end game, if, you, if we have a king and pawn end game, and you have two center pawns, and I have two side pawns, I win. I push my side pawns, and your king goes, nah, 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 and he can't. Nothing he can do. That's exactly what happens in this game. The center pawns, I easily stop. But when I push my H pawn and my B pawn, what are you going to do? And that's what happened. Here comes the H pawn and the B pawn. The knight has to stop the H pawn. Now white's king's moving on up. Moving on up to the king's side. On up. And that pawn on the seventh rank is pretty strong. And now black is in Wang Chung, or if you want to speak English, Zugzwang, which is German. Black can't move his king, or his knight, or his pawns. The truth hurts. Now, if black does want to move his knight, he can play knight h8, okay? Which he did. Knight d4, he still can't move anything. So he played king here. He had a, he had a trick, but tricks are for kids. He said, ha ha, I keep my king there and you'll never get out. And your knight can't come and help because I got this past pawn. This is actually funny how Nakamura wins. He says, your move, then he attacks both pawns. And then black says, I'm gonna play king here, king here, king here. If your knight ever moves in there, I'm queening. And this pawn doesn't help. I still play king f8, king f7. But Nakamura has a very funny way to win. Very easy too. Knight d2, king f8, knight f3. And I'm sure Naka saw this, you know, 10 moves ago. And that's it. If you play king f7, I play knight e5 check and take your pawn. If you play d2, I take it. If you move your king, I move my king. What's funny is, if you play d2 and take, if this pawn is off the board, okay, it's not off the board. If it was, 
This position is a draw or a win, depending on whose move it is. What's funny is it's black's move, so black's losing. So pretend that pawn isn't there. Here, 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 here. And white wins. In this position, this pawn wasn't here, and it's white's turn to move. This is a draw. This is a known draw. You can't lose a tempo with a knight. You can't, like, lose a tempo and then play knight. You can't get this position with black to move. It's impossible. And the reason is white, black, white, black, white, black, white, black. You can't, you can't, change, you can't do anything about it. But since Naka has the F pawn, all that stuff is irrelevant. Just to make it simple for you guys, in this position, if it was white's move, which it's not, white could just play F3. Never play F3, so F4. Then the king has to move, king G7, etc. Then Naka would promote to a bishop, sacrifice his pawn, and fail to mate with bishop and knight, which he's already done. Terrible. Okay, so that's another game where black never got his pawn back. Here's the game, Carlson versus Bulligan. And this is the game that I remember, me personally, where black stopped playing the Benko Gambit. Because Magnus just sort of ran him over. I thought the game was super complicated, but the engine says, no, it wasn't that complicated. The engine said it wasn't complicated at all. So they played the same variation. Everything's the same. This variation seems like white's getting a good position, pawn up. This is still Naka's game that we just saw with Bulligan. Queen e2, queen b6, a4. This is still the same position. Rook here. I think Naka played bishop d2. I think so. Okay, and, and Carlson played something else. And I remember playing against the Benko, I would play knight e2 a lot. I would try to get my knights like this. <clears throat> And then I talked to some pop star, and they said knights like this. I mean, if I knew the pop star's name, that would be funnier. I guess I'm going to hear about it a lot in the chat, in the comments section of YouTube. Okay, so uh, in this position, I'm black's down a pawn. So where's the compensation? I don't know. Okay, Bulligan knows. Bulligan's world's leading authority on the Benko Gambit for 2,700 players. Let's see what he does. He plays 98 which he did against Naka, the bishop's getting open, the knight's coming to c7. Bishop g5, threatening the e-pawn. We have a threat. Queen d8, defending the e-pawn. Rook a3, typical move in the Benko. Knight b6, attacking the pawn on a4. b3, defending it. And again, maybe black has some compensation, maybe, but white's a pawn up. So... Is black going to win the pawn back? No. Is black going to make a queen? No. Is black attacking the white king? No. Black's down a pawn. So, you know, if we give black a pawn, like on a5 or a7, maybe it's about equal. But, okay, queen d7. He puts his rook on a2 where it's defended by his queen. Never play f6. The bishop goes all the way back. F5, which he played in the other game against Naka, so his d5 pawn could be attacked. Takes, takes. Against Naka, he took on d5 in a similar position, but the queens were already off. With the queens on, queen c4 is annoying. Getting checkmated is annoying, so he just takes back. Rook d1, defending the d pawn. And I don't want to say at every move, but white is up a pawn. What's black's compensation? That's what the super GMs are asking. And if super GMs don't think they have enough compensation, they don't play this line. And it used to be in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you could just argue, I have compensation, rawr, I'm stronger than you. And the other guy's like, I'm weaker than you, but you don't. And then nobody agreed, you played chess games, somebody blundered on move 38 and time trouble, and we still don't know. Well, today we have engines. And if the engine says white's up 1.3, then grandmasters don't want to have black. If you see what I'm saying. Okay. So, ne nebulous compensate. Knight f6 attacking the d-pawn. Queen e6 check. White's still up a pawn. Black's trying to get active pieces. White attacks the weak pawn on f5. Knife f5. Black plays c4, destroying the queen side, winning all of white's queen side pawns. 
takes, takes, knight c7. You'll see that black was threatening rook takes knight because of the pin on the a pawn. So knight c7, attacking the rook. Knight c3, attacking both rooks. You can see it's super complicated unless you're an engine. The engine's like, no, this is good for white. Obviously, Carlson knows it's good for white too, but in the 70s and 80s, if you're getting these kinds of positions, you're probably sort of happy. You're like, I'm black. This is a fighting game. It's complicated. Engines don't exist yet. I wonder if you're actually thinking that. So, so and I don't know. Well, somebody's going to win. Okay, knight a8, knight a2. Everybody goes back. Rook c8. Now, in this position, this pawn has been attacked for a while, but so is the f pawn. So as soon as somebody takes one pawn, they'll take the other one, but they're just avoiding taking the pawns and making other moves. Attacking the knight, knight b5, takes the knight. Can he save his f pawn? Yes. He saves his f pawn and attacks the b pawn. He's still been a pawn down the whole game. Rook b3, white's threatening b6, b7, b8 with advantage. Knight a5 attacking the rook, rook b1, also attacking the bishop. Rook, rook b1 defending both, bishop d4, nice bishop, b6, nicer pawn. Knight b7 looks forced, rook d4, we can trade bishops. He says, ha ha, I get a pawn. So finally he won his pawn back by making a, uh, a uh, there's a name for this tactic. Somebody, somebody help me. Um, that's what happens when you get old. You say a tactics name 50 times, then you forget the name of it. Um, it's when you have, two, you have two pieces hanging, so you give up one of your pieces for something. Then when you trade the pieces, you won that something. What's that? Desperado. Desperado, thank you. I, I need to think of the eagles more. Desperado, why can't you remember the name of the tactic? Okay, so he takes, he throws in a check because that's cute. You got to admit it's cute. You got to admit it. That's cute. Okay, then he takes, so he won his pawn back for one move, then he lost his F pawn. He's still down a pawn, and then we got this action going on. That's the pawn he's down. Also, this pawn is hanging. Rook check, king g4, knight c5. Now, I don't know why he didn't play king f8, because in a blitz game, I play king f8. Now that I'm looking at it, wow, rook, rook a4 is just mate. Wow, king f8 defending my pawn, rook a4 threatening mate. Okay, I can stop the mate, but it's worse than mate. It's worse. I can play knight d8. Then, then king e8. See, I stopped the mate. I'm good. And then after b7, it's worse than mate. Man, truth hurts. And here's funny if you like funny. I'm not saying you like funny. In this position, what, black has these two pawns that can move, and once they can't move, he's going to have to walk into mate. So we win the game by just blocking the pawn or taking it. Black has to checkmate himself. Man, the truth hurts. Worse than mate. And then that's the only legal move. Okay, so now I know why he didn't play king f8, because rook a4 just wins instantly. So he played, so instead he played knight c5, and white said, that, that doesn't stop my b pawn. And that was move 40. They must have just got to time control, and Bulgan's like, oh, darn. So that game, I remember that game. I remember looking at that game after they played it. And... People were like, Magnus beat the Benko pretty easily. That might put death to the Benko. Like, White was a pawn up the whole game. Black never got his pawn back. And eventually he queened his B pawn. Now, of course, Magnus is better than Bulligan. And Magnus is White. So if the, if the, if the pairing is Carlson Bulligan, I don't care what the opening is, you know. But in this particular instance, you know, people are like, why am I playing the Benko? This, I'm a pawn down. And, I, and, and it's, a, it's a queenside pawn, and Magnus queen one of his queenside pawns. I, why, why am I playing this opening? What did I get out of it? I mean, to be fair, uh, Magnus is also winning on the king side. 
Magnus is e-pawn in knight e7 and king is better. Magnus is better everywhere. So black didn't get enough compensation ever. And super GMs, <clears throat> they don't want to lose without thinking they made, did something really dumb. And it didn't look like Bulligan did anything dumb. It looked like he was just always much worse. Much worse. And then he was lost. And they're like, well, I don't want to play this opening. Okay, another game, and the last one we're going to look at, where uh, people said this game also killed the Benko. They referred to this game also. Kramnik Topolov. Now, this game was a 1,000 moves, but Topolov was just a pawn down the whole game, and he was suffering. And Topolov's pretty good. Topolov used to play the Benko, you know, in the, in the 90s. Okay, now this is different. Kramnik didn't play e4 uh, the same way he did. He just fianchettoed his bishop. So it's the same except the bishops are on the board. Black has a bishop here. White has a bishop here. Otherwise, it's pretty similar. Kramnik played rook b1, getting off of this diagonal. Castles. Bishop d2. And he said, I'm up a pawn. Where's your compensation? And Topolov said, I have compensation. So they argue. They look at the engines. They look at the results. And then Topolov doesn't play the Benko anymore. So this is a very similar line to the e4, king f1, king g2 line. It's just that the white square bishops are still on the board. Okay, black's playing the same way that Bulligan was playing. White's playing the same way as the other games, just that they both have white square bishops on the board. b3. So Topolov decides to win his pawn back, but I don't know. I mean, if white plays e4, I, I don't... I, white seems like he's a pawn up and better. I don't know. I, so he gets his pawn back, but man... I'm glad I have my white square bishop now. We didn't trade him. That's very dangerous. And, and you've opened up your king here. You don't want to play g6 and trade off your dark squared bishop. So black got his pawn back. But at what cost? The answer is fries. Knight e5. Kramnik with the magical tactics. Confusing the audience. So the threat is knight takes d7. Which forks the queen and rook and wins a knight. So you have to take the knight. Oh, give me the knight. Bishop takes. Now he has the two bishops. What else? And now Kramnik trades everything into this great endgame where black has a doubled pawn, an isolated pawn, and white has a protected pass pawn. This ending, nobody wants to play with black. Rook c1. This is just black trying to draw, and trying is the first step to failure. Never play f6. He's hoping... For queen c5, queen c5, rook c5, rook a4. And this is probably a draw. Probably. I'd still take white, but okay. He played queen e4, rook c3, and white's just a pawn up, and the c5 pawn is weak. The a5, a4 pawn is good. And Kramnik had his usual great technique. They traded everything. Now, now he has a pass pawn against these double pawns. Check. It's check. You can't take the rook. And this rook and pawn ending is always winning when the rook's behind the pawn. So he put his rook there. And you, the only thing black can do is move his king all the way over here and take the pawn. And when he does that, white wins on the king's side. Very instructive. White's pushing on the king's side. We can't take this and let white, white's king take all the pawns. So f5. E4, we can't let white take on F5 and then play G6, G7, G8. So E6. And now he attacks the E pawn. He plays, if he plays King C6, this is an easy win, obviously. Rook takes check, rook takes rook, etc. So he plays King C7. That way, if you play rook takes E5, I can take and defend my pawn. Ah, smart. Go top of love. Okay, King E3. Well, now if you play king b6, it's the same thing. I can, your rook's not defending e6 anymore if you, if you block your rook. So he played king b8, and his idea is he's going to move his rook maybe to e7, and then king a7, and eventually his rook will be good. Rook takes e5, takes rook c5, 
and now the king is trapped on the B file. He can never go to the king's side, and White just saunters in and takes everything. So it's three against three. Finally, for the first time in the game, we have even pawn structure. Three against three, no pass pawns for White, but Black's king is out of the game. He keeps the black king out of the game. And he says, yeah, your king can come back. I'm going to win this end game. And unfortunately, this is a passed pawn on the fifth rank that's defended, and my king's not here. If the king was in here, we have good drawing chances. White gets his king up. And there's, there's, no, there's nothing that black can do. White's going to move his king up and win. Rook's g1, trying to check from behind. Now he stops the king from moving up. If he plays the move king g8, I play rook e7. And you have to play rook here, and I come up, and so forth. Rook f7, king f6. So he plays king e8. And now white plays a very nice winning move, the move f5. Really, really nice move. So... If you, take, if you take with the pawn, then I can win by playing rook takes or king g5. This king and pawn ending is winning. And white queens. And if you play e5, everything wins. f6, king g5, king f3. If you take with the, with the rook, it's the same king and pawn ending. White's winning. White, black goes here, which I didn't look at. We go here. King g5 also wins. And it doesn't matter where the king goes. We go here, I go here. And if you go here, I go here. It's the, same, it's the same position that we just looked at. It won't let me play king f6. The computer's tricky. Ha ha, I played it. And we queen and so forth. So after f5, Topolov resigned. If you have an engine that's good, it should announce mate here. It's probably like mate in 19 or something would be my guess. It's, this is a table-based position, so it sees all the way to the end. It already knows the answer. The answer is already known. So that game, Topolov never had full compensation for his pawn, and when he won his pawn back, his position sucked. So all of these games where two super GMs are playing, Black didn't get enough compensation for a pawn, was suffering, and other super GMs are like, I don't, I don't see what I'm supposed to do to get compensation. So basically at the top level, they stopped playing it. The engines and the super GMs like it for white. At the lower levels, you're not gonna play people with such great technique that are a pawn up and they slowly grind you down like Karpov and Kramnik and Carlson. The, the big three, the all C, all K. And, and Nakamura, just really good play. And black didn't blunder in those games, black was just worse. And you can play the Benko Gambit at lower levels, but if you're over 2750, I still don't know why you're watching this video. Eh, probably play, play another opening. Because other openings right now against D4, Black's doing low with the Queen's Gambit declined, Queen's Gambit accepted, Nibzo Indian. Th those, are, th those are all fine. Semi-Slav, Slav, Black. That's what the opening Super GMs play, and they don't have to give up a pawn. Super GMs hate giving up a pawn. They don't like it. That's why you don't see a lot of King's Gambits and Goring Gambit and Bishop's Opening gam all these Gambits. Lower levels, those are fun to play. At the higher level, when the engine says you're worse and you have the white pieces, you decide you're not going to play that way because you don't want to be worse. You're not playing for tricks. You're just playing the best move every time. And most Super GMs, if not all of them, don't think the Benko Gambit is the best way to play. Well, I want to thank again Stephen Hensley. Thanks for sponsoring the lecture. If you want to sponsor a lecture, contact Karen, karen at atlchessclub.com, and I'll see you guys next week with another lecture. Bye. Bye.